Hi everyone, it's Alexa from TNAC Creek. How are you? I'm gonna wait a few seconds to make sure that we are functioning and up and live for all of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to be starting off our interview series, our conversations from the Cottonwoods. Um, this series is going to talk about all things important in our watershed, in watersheds um, across the state. And we are grateful for funding for this project through the Watershed Institute, um, who we have with us tonight, Priscilla Oliveira, who is the outreach coordinator for the Watershed Institute. Um, and she's going to be talking to us tonight about why our organizations um, are so important and critical and what we do, um, what her organization does it particularly and why it's so um, important in our state. So I'm gonna throw this over to Allie to start off with our first question um, for Priscilla. And if you have questions, please leave them in the comments and we have time at the end to answer everything. So like Alexa said, Priscilla, we are so happy to have you, with, have you here with us today. Um, our first question, if you could tell us a little bit about your role at the Watershed Institute. Sure thing. It's great to be here today. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm the Outreach Specialist at the Watershed Institute and have been for almost a year now. Um, there are kind of three categories to boil down all my responsibilities with, and those are building partnerships and collaboration, environmental justice and equity, and community engagement with advocacy. So um, I spend a lot of my time working and engaging with our partners and other nonprofit organizations such as yourselves. Um, and I also help manage the New Jersey Council of Watershed Associations, which consists of around 20 watershed nonprofit organizations across the state. We help each other by advocating for local and state environmental issues, um, and those most commonly pertain to our water resources. Um, so recently uh, in 2019, the directors and the board at the Watershed Institute um, kind of gave the go ahead for some staff, including myself to form a council that focuses on environmental justice and equity at the Watershed Institute. Um, and since then, we've just been focusing on how to internally incorporate justice, equity, diversity, and inclusive practices into the work culture at the Watershed Institute as a way to support the development of future programming that could be more accessible to our surrounding underserved communities. That's great work. We'd love to hear that. That's Yeah, happening. that's so exciting. Yeah, it's been a learning curve, but we're definitely uh, moving forward with all that. Um, the Watershed Institute provides a lot of opportunities for ed adult education, ranging from smaller workshops and webinars to the Watershed Institute's annual Watershed Conference, which I would love to plug in really quickly here today. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's going to be running the week of November 2nd, except for November 3rd, so everyone can go out and vote. Um, it's so important. <laughs> everyone needs to get out there. Yes, please go out and vote. Um, there are already 14 sessions scheduled, and the keynote speaker this year is going to be Ben Strauss from Climate Central, who will be speaking on the oldest stories in history that illustrate what climate change means for humanity. Um, registration for that event is now open on our website. And though there is a $20 fee just to help with uh, support future programs at the Watershed Institute, we're very flexible in handing out scholarships. Um, we don't want finances to get in the way if you're really interested in the topic this year, which is going to be climate change impacts on New Jersey waterways. That's that very exciting. I really hope that everyone listening attends this conference. It is gonna be amazing. I know that we definitely want to attend as well. Um, yeah. Can you also tell us just a little bit more about the mission of the Watershed Institute? Sure thing. So at the Watershed Institute, um, uh, we have been working to keep central New Jersey's waters safe, clean, and healthy through conservation, advocacy, science, and education since 1949. Um, our programs incorporate scientific investigation through research, monitor, monitoring, and GIS analysis. Um, and we also incorporate stewardship practices and of land management, water conservation, and habitat restoration on the 950-acre watershed reserve in Pennington, New Jersey. Um, we advocate for the protection and restoration of water and watersheds through municipal and state environmental regulations and also provide environmental education. 
So we strive for a future where municipal governments, civic institutions, public and private schools, businesses and residents understand the implications of land use um, and operational decisions and how they make, oh, so sorry, the, the implications that land use have on our water resources, environmental health and the stability of our climate. And as a result, we envision a future where policies and practices are adopted to remediate some of the current issues we have like flooding and water pollution um, and ensure the availability of clean drinking water, uh, provide access to safe water-based recreation uh, opportunities and restore fish and wildlife habitats across the state. I really love that that's all of the work that you guys are doing. It's so much and it's so great. Um, and we definitely see it mirrored in the mission of Teaneck Creek, um, where we are working to um, restore the legacy of our environmental watershed. And so what that means is restoring the park to its glory of a functioning wetland, which we're doing um, with our current restoration. So definitely a huge emphasis on the importance of clean water and what it means not only for people for drinking, but for the habitat that um, we have and we're lucky to have. Um, so while, you know, Tina Creek is 46 acres and I know you're working within a much larger, larger watershed, we all understand the connectivity of watersheds and how um, they are so important that we have clean water at all points because we know water all leads to the ocean, right? And it's all part of the same system um, and it's really important that way. So um, I have the next question. And it is based on the um, water and why it's important to be clean and what we're doing about it. Um, so my question to you is, the Watershed Institute conducts water quality testing of local waterways. Can you tell us more about the importance of water quality monitoring and citizen science? Yes, I can. So our water quality monitoring program, our volunteer program, it's called StreamWatch, and it's the oldest ongoing program at the Watershed Institute. If you can believe it, volunteers have been involved in it since 1992. Oh, wow. And yeah, and we still have some of those <laughs> older members with us. Some lifers. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely great. some StreamWatch lifers there. And have measured the health of, um, we, we measured the health of waterways, uh, by testing water chemistry, measuring bacterial levels, and assessing that biolog biological and physical health of waterways. Um, so it's really essential to our mission um, because it's it ties into understanding that human impact on waterways. It gives us that deeper understanding of what land use changes um, are, how they're impacting local waterways and how changes to local regulations can help improve those in some cases. And it also helps us understand legacy pollution um, and what, like you were saying, like how that continues to have an impact on our waterways and how it will continue until it's addressed. Um, and, and really it's all about how impaired waterways impact our communities. So like the drinking water recreation piece, um, it's all about community health and bringing our communities back to water, uh, safe water. <laughs> And <laughs> yes, not just any water. Uh, in many cases, the water quality monitoring helps us identify specific problems and strategize solutions. And we really invite um, the public to give their input and converse with us and let us know when there's an issue happening because many times they're our first line of defense. They can point to us where the issues are happening um, and where these issues might be originating from. So like recently we tested high levels of E. coli in um, a place called PD, PD Lake. Um, and we also received a call about sediment from Macquarie and Montgomery. And these are just citizens reaching out to us and letting us know, uh, hey, there the water, it looks uh, like real, like there's a lot of sediment or it's very milky or something like that. So the citizen science portion of it um, really makes water quality monitoring easy, fun for the public to get involved with. They inherently end up learning a lot about water quality, the science of it, the environmental impacts, um, and it helps us expand on our advocacy mission to uh, help bring this to municipalities and to communities. That's so exciting. I love hearing about how your citizen scientists make an impact on ensuring that all of our waterways are safe. We also do some citizen science testing at Tina Creek. We have some adults and also some children who come out and do it. And it's so exciting 
to especially see the kids and as they start to get excited about like what's in our water and how they can help all of that type of stuff. I really think it sets people up for a lifetime of activism and really caring about the environment. So that is so exciting. Um, so I know that the Watershed Institute also manages a wastewater wetland, a uh, rain garden, a green roof. Can you tell us like a little bit more about the importance of these and the connection between runoff control practices and land management for our watersheds? Yes, so that's actually a big issue that we're undertaking right now because um, in March of this year, I think the NJDP passed their new green stormwater rule or not passed, they adopted it. Um, and, and that pretty much um, makes it so that municipalities are going to start having to use green infrastructure in, in major developments and new major developments. And we want to help ensure that, you know, the green infrastructure is going in the most appropriate place, that there's maintenance involved. Um, this all comes down to the science department at the Watershed Institute, which they do a great job. Our stewardship coordinator, Allison Jackson, they manage the reserve and help us, the Institute itself, physically reduce impact on local watersheds. That includes the waste, let, or the waste um, wetland where all of our facilities plumbing release water for a process of natural recycling into wow. the wetland. Yeah, so um, we also maintain rain gardens and a green roof that just helps uh, reduce the polluted runoff into the uh, waterways. The closest ones to us are the Stony Brook and Millstone. Um, our trail map also re reveals that we have to manage a variety of different natural habitats for wildlife and species conservation. Um, and that just really helps provide that natural buffer uh, instead of having to go out and like build a, build a rain garden or something like that. These are natural buffers that uh, between roads and runoff sources and our nearby waterways. Um, these habitats include a farm, meadows, wetlands, and some forests. Um, so like I said, green infrastructure is really big on our agenda right now. And that's because it has such a potential to make a huge impact in not only reducing flooding, but also addressing a lot of that pollution in ways that are natural. And um, it, it's just something that can really be applied all over a broad spectrum across a region and stuff like that. So. Um, the, the, the thing is, sorry. No, absolutely. I'm trying to catch up with my I notes. agree with, with what you're saying, 100%. <laughs> so, um, green infrastructure is really important. Uh, these are things like bioswills, rain gardens, green roofs. They help create that, uh, more habitat and natural filtration between human impacts and waterways. Um, and it's also important to preserve the natural habitat so that they may have they may serve as the natural non-structural barrier between pollutants and waterways. And um, yeah, so like I've been saying, we're working really hard on that this year. It's basically, it's been a really big focus in our webinars and our workshops. We actually just had a workshop with, um, co-hosted by ANJAC with municipalities on the importance of enhanced stormwater ordinances that include more green infrastructure than what is required by the state. We had around 245 uh, municipal officials, environmental commissioners, um, planners, zoners all attend and they represented over 150 uh, towns across the state. So trying to get the word out there that not just what the state has said, but like there has to be more um, in terms of how much green infrastructure is going out there to actually reverse the impacts of pollution and flooding. Um, but on top of all that, we are also planning some maintenance webinars for 2021 for the rain gardens and green infrastructure that will be going in. Uh, we have a river friendly program, which is something any residents can participate in to find out their own impact and potentially achieve river friendly certification. We have children's programs that teach kids at very young age how poor soil and land management can lead to environmental issues. And the list goes on and on. I can honestly spend all night talking <laughs> about how we try to incorporate these things together. 
Oh, it's awesome to hear that there's so many things like that going on. I know um, for us at Teaneck Creek with our restoration ongoing, the whole topic of stormwater and green infrastructure is so in what we're about right now. Our park is obviously closed um, in a large part for our restoration, which if everyone stays tuned for the next few of these, we're going to be talking a lot more about what's going on at Teaneck Creek. Um, but green infrastructure is a huge portion of the project and making sure that we are working on stormwater management. Um, so it's really cool to see how it's also being navigated across the state and what your organization is doing and how um, this is really what is becoming the, the new norm. And I think that's really important um, to understand that a lot of our organizations are working on the same topics. And so it's so great to have these wonderful partnerships and abilities to work together because we all have the same mission and that's you know making the world a better, greener place. Um, and there are so many ways that we can do it. And through so many programs, like you're saying, um, mostly through education, I think that's a huge portion of it. Um, and for advocacy and talking with those that are in charge and um, especially being, you know, great citizens and working with our government. Um, so those are all so great. Um, as we plugged before, please get out and vote, obviously. Um, but I do have the um, final question of the night for you. Um, and this one is, like we said before, Tina Creek was given a grant that helped make this um, project possible. Um, but you also gave us another grant this year. Um, so the first, this one is for disseminating information about our restoration and implementing citizen science programs. And the other was the Roots for Rivers, where we are currently in the midst of planting over 200 trees, which will help prevent erosion. Can you tell us about how the Watershed Institute uses grants to promote environmental stewardship and increase your impact? Yes, I can. So this is a major part of my job role, I would say. Um, managing these grants really helps me get closer to these other organizations, which is what I love. I like to meet you guys and work with you guys. Um, you like meeting you too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It, it's like really important projects that are happening, not just in the Stony Brook Millstone watershed area, but across the state. So it has a way bigger impact than what we could do alone at the Watershed Institute. Um, so in the case of the small grant program, which uh, is what we are funding, one of the programs we are funding you through, uh, it's funded by the Dodge Foundation. And um, we do this by funding projects that cover four targeted actions that not only increase the stewardship efforts across the state, but also ensure that they have a positive impact outcomes and that they're effective at meeting their project goals. And those four actions are water quality science and education, stormwater policy, green infrastructure, and climate change resiliency. And along with those four targeted actions, we actually also um, seek somewhat to fund projects that address inequities. It's like an un underwritten, like it's not actually written in the grant goals or anything like that, but we want to address the inequities and justice issues uh, around the, the state um, to reflect our commitment and also to address really big issues in environmental justice communities like Trenton, Camden, and Newark. Um, so we also uh, have the Roots for Rivers program, which this year will unfortunately be the last year of the Roots for Rivers program. But uh, yeah, it's a part of it right in the nick of time. Yeah, <laughs> it's a partnership with the natural uh, with the Nature Conservancy um, in collaboration with Sustainable Jersey. Uh, we fund we have funded actually at this point municipalities, governmental agencies, nonprofits like yourselves um, for projects that undertake floodplain reforestation initiatives. And what that means is that whole piece about reversing the impacts of flooding and runoff um, by putting trees back in places they have been taken out or deforested. So it really ties into that bigger commitment to address uh, protection of water quality by addressing the stormwater impacts. Um, by the end of this grant cycle, which should be ending in a few weeks in November, uh, give or take because of COVID-19, we're being really flexible with it. Uh, we look forward to achieving the Nature Conservancy's goal of planting 100,000 trees by the end of this year. So we're really excited. And we are happy to be a part of it. We were able to get just over 200 that um, we still have a few left that actually have to get in the ground. But we yes, did our big volunteer. Sorry. To... 
Here's a plug on our end. We yes. have a pop-up planting on Sunday. If exactly. It's free on Sunday at 10 a.m. Meet us at the Fike Lane entrance. We're finishing planting the rest of our trees. We have a bunch of them left. Um, but it's wonderful to hear that these projects are happening and it's a great resource for other environmental nonprofits. I know some of the um, people that are watching are some of our colleagues um, that are in not environmental nonprofits. So I think it's great to hear from you as a resource for funding, um, for even what to focus on um, within your, you know, for standards, I think that's really great. And with the undertone of environmental justice is so important, especially in a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, we do have a question that came in um, from Facebook. So um, Mike asks, what can we do to encourage our town to build green infrastructure like green gardens? So um, it really comes down to getting yourself in front of the the town officials and the environmental commission. Um, so really the way, the approach that we're taking at the Watershed Institute is by uh, having the towns as much as possible adopt, adopt the enhanced stormwater ordinance, which includes a lot more, um, you know, policy and regulation for green infrastructure in towns than what NJDP pr uh, provided in their, in their rule. And, so it, it it's been a you know it's been a, a definitely a journey um, to kind of convince these towns that they should. I, I feel like they don't really need convincing at this point because there's so many there's so much flooding happening, there's so much uh, pollution coming up that um, really it's just getting in front of them and letting them know the town cares about this, the citizens want this. So you know, getting to that local advocacy piece and. Uh, calling your neighbors and stuff like that and going to virtual Zoom meetings at this point because yeah. most town councilors aren't meeting in person. So it's actually easier than ever to raise a voice for these kinds of issues and advocate for a stronger ordinance or tell them that we should have more green infrastructure in this town. Who would have thought a positive outcome from COVID? Yeah, it's <laughs> actually crazy. Right? But no, that's wonderful. It's great advice to just be more engaged and make sure that you are understanding what's coming up in your local towns and um, knowing knowing your government and understanding how to be involved. I think that's really great, especially also to know that there is this um, push for more green infrastructure and that yes. you know hopefully municipalities will adopt it if their citizens are engaged and understanding that they need to be doing that. That's really, really important, really great. Yeah. Um, I actually have wait. one more question for you, if, oh. if you'll entertain it. <laughs> Can I, I just yes. want to say one thing about the other question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so the Watershed Institute does actually have resources that you can send to your town council or you can potentially call on us. The calendar is chock full of presentations that our municipal policy specialist, Sophie, is giving to these towns. But we have the webinar from a few weeks ago with the municipalities was recorded. So you can send that ahead Wonderful. or you can send them the model ordinance and tell them like it's written out for you. Like, let's talk about it, put it on your agenda, that kind of stuff, so. That's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. If you wouldn't mind, maybe you can share that link with us. We'll post it on our website. On I our will, website. I will, I will share it with you. <laughs> so I have one more semi-related question. So Alexa had pointed out that a lot of the people watching tend to be like colleagues of ours, aspiring environmentalists. Um, as someone with a career in the environmental field, I just wanted to say, what do you recommend for people that really want to like do this either as a career or they're extremely passionate about it? What can they do to get involved? So I, I, I'm not sure. I feel like I stumbled into my job, if I'm being honest. I don't feel like that a little bit. Yeah, no, I feel that way. Yeah, yeah, it's only been a year for me, so I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. I would say that um, my biggest uh, recommendation is that you don't necessarily need that fancy master's degree or anything like that to get started. You should try and put yourself out there either through volunteering if you have the time or being involved in a local nonprofit is a really good way to like build those connections. Um, and the other thing is just find something that you really like to do. The environmental field is so big. You could be a lot of things within there. Find something you're passionate about that you want to attend a conference about that you want to network about. And, you know, I hope the best that it leads to something because 
that's really where the world is at right now. So. No, I agree with you 100%. I actually think that's amazing advice. Uh, personally, I also fell into my career and I started out volunteering somewhere and then it just led its path. So that's great. Really great advice. That was all of our questions for tonight. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Priscilla, and for answering all of our questions. This was really impactful and insightful. Um, and I hope everyone got something out of it. Um, and if you are watching, we have another one of these scheduled for Thursday night with Don Torino, who is the president of Burden County Audubon. And we're going to be talking more about the habitat at Tina Creek and why it is critically important, um, where we are located, um, along the Atlantic Flyway. And so we're excited to be talking about that and the impacts of um, habitat loss and all of that as well. Um, so stay tuned, come back uh, on Thursday. And yeah, thank you again so much for joining us. And if you have any additional questions, please leave them in the comments if you're watching this after um, we stop being live. We will do our best to answer everything. Um, if you have questions directly for Priscilla, we will share them with her and get you guys an answer. So thanks so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Be well. Bye. Thanks guys. Thank you again. Bye. For Thank you for Bye. having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs>